the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, by definition, by its name, it's supposed to exist to defend the United States, to keep us safe, to keep us out of wars that we don't need to fight. And if we do have to fight, to make sure that we finish them. That's the purpose of having a national defense force. But we are in a situation right now, have been for a long time, but we're getting deeper into a situation to where because of our own actions, we're turning the Department of Defense into the, the instrument of some potential harm to our own country. Now, <clears throat> we talk a lot about the, about some of the foolish decisions that a lot of our ma leaders make or about uh, some crazy things they may say, things that are irrational, illogical, and sometimes that makes you roll your eyes or so. But I'm going to show you in context how some of the things that are going on in some of the biggest theaters of operation right now are much more concerning than, than a first meets the eye. It's not just a matter of, well, that's not smart, or, well, if Trump was in, he would do better, or anything like that. This is the, the arrogance and hubris of, of our country's leaders of the elite right now that is almost contradicting what the Department of Defense is supposed to be for and actually putting us at increased risk. Let's take a look at that first of all, because everything always starts at the top. It's the leaders that matter. And, and it has to start at the very, very top, which is the commander in chief, the president of the United States. Now, we've you've seen us show this uh, 60 minutes uh, little blurb by Biden several times in, during on our shows over the over the months uh, because it just shows kind of how he's disconnected from what's really going on in the ground or, 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 or even a full understanding of the limits of American power. It's not just him. This goes back decades. In fact, is this montage that Gary put together really shows it. We're the United States of America, for God's sake. The most powerful nation in the history, not in the world, in the history of the world. The history of the world. The United States has the best military by far anywhere in the world. We have the best intelligence in the world. If Americans anywhere are threatened, we have all of those targets already fully identified, and I am ready and prepared to take whatever action is necessary. But it is undeniable, our military is the most capable fighting force on the planet. It's not close. Our soldiers are the best trained, best equipped land force on Earth, tested by years of combat, able to sustain power anywhere in the globe. Nobody can match our army. And our priority is the greatest country on the face of the earth, the great land called America. I have pledged that throughout the life of this administration, our military will remain the best trained, the best equipped, the best prepared fighting force on earth. Well, those are all great words, and that's always been a, a, a point of pride for Americans and you know, especially all these patriotic, red-blooded, you know, folks are always happy to hear that. And most people are, even if you're not a big cheerleader of it. It's a good feeling to know that the national defense capability of your country will keep you safe. It's not just our, our two oceans and the two friendly countries to our north and south, but it's also our, our ICBM force, our nuclear capacity, our conventional force, our Navy, our Air Force, our Army, our ability to project power will keep us safe. That's a good feeling. And by the way, that's actually the, the case. Our force is powerful enough to keep us safe indefinitely. It is possible, it is capable of deterring anybody from making an unprovoked attack against us and, and as, as far as we can see, as long as, and it's not, a, it's not a, a blanket statement, it has a provision, as long as we make prudent choices and wise decisions. It's not just enough to be able to beat your chest and say how strong you are. You have to have the wisdom that goes along with the strength, or you could misuse that strength and actually cause harm to yourself, not defend yourself. Now, I'm going to take some of the biggest issues that we have facing us right now and just show you a few representative samplings, and I'm going to show you why the arrogant statements are harmful and where they could go. We're going to start off looking at the... Uh, uh, the Iran-Israel situation, since that one's kind of in the news a lot today. Uh, and then we're going to go to the Russia-Ukraine war, and then we're going to go to the Indo-Pacific. And in each case, you're going to see some really arrogant, presumptuous statements that are not backed up 
by ground truth reality. Let's start off first with the Israel Hamas situation. Uh, and we have uh, David Petraeus, who's arguing here that, yes, we need to support Israel doing whatever they're going to do into Rafa. You don't send the fire department to put out 70 or 80 percent of the blaze. You need to take it all out. So, so do you think I would they should then is, go into Rafa? I do think they have to, but you have to do it the right way. Okay. The Rafa issue is something we've been talking a lot about here on this channel. It's, it's in the news again today because apparently Netanyahu has, has given an order, has selected a date, and they're going to go into Rafa. Even though the U.S. at the official level has been saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, you have Netanyahu says, I'm going to do it anyway, and, and then you have people like Petraeus and several others, it was a couple we're going to show you in a minute, are cheerleading them on, yes, go ahead and do it. Here's the problem. You can't succeed that way. Netanyahu has committed his country to a military path to seek a political objective, bring his, make his country safe, that cannot be accomplished. David Petraeus, of all people in America, should know that that is an unattainable military objective, and especially in Rafa, because <clears throat> Rafa is where so many people have gone. There's now over a million people in that area, and there's nowhere for them to go. But we've seen that the Israeli army has just recently left uh, Khan Yunus after they occupied that area, and it's nothing but a moonscape. It's just, it looks like something from World War II. It was just just wiped out. There's nothing but skeletons of buildings left over. That's what they're getting ready to do down here in Khan Yunus, uh, in, in Rafa. But where are the people going to go to be safe? And if he goes in there and there is no path to get the people out, then the, the casualties that have been sparked up to this point, uh, allegedly over 33,000 Palestinian people have been killed, mostly women and children. That number is just going to spike up again. And, and the, the Israel is already on the knife's edge of losing Western support. And they're already got a lot of angst from other members uh, of the Arab community, especially in the Middle East. They're very much against them. This could push them over the edge to even lose American support, which was heretofore unthinkable. But because of so many actions like this, that's where we're at right now. Petraeus should know that he should not advocate them going into taking out the Hamas in Rafah because it can't be done. And what I mean by can't be done yes, Israel can go and kill any number of people. That won't attain the objective because they can't identify. Who is Hamas and who is just a Palestinian man? And they cannot go in there and kill 300 or somewhere around 300,000 Palestinian men, at least, who were in that area there, because there is ostensibly four battalions or somewhere around 10 or 12,000 uh, Hamas fighters that can't be identified. You can't look at a person and say, this guy is a Hamas guy and this guy is just a Palestinian man. So shoot this one, don't shoot that one. You understand how that's almost virtually impossible to identify. So what does that leave? That means that they're going to kill anything that moves. We've You've heard some of uh, Andre, Jose Andre, you know, the other day talk about that. By he, All his evidence shows that on the ground, Israel's rules of engagement say if it moves, shoot it. And, and certainly that's been the case that we've seen so far. It's why the casualty count so high. So you can't go in there and do that or you're going to end up killing more people and you're going to cost the political and diplomatic cover that uh, Israel has had up to this point. And it's going to cause more instability for Israel. And it's going to cause damage to us when people around the world See American leaders say this kind of unsustainable nonsense that they can see with their own eyes. Is it true? Then it lowers our credibility and reputation everywhere. It makes it harder for us to get things done anywhere. It makes nobody want to follow us, whether friends or, or foes, to begrudgingly do what we ask because we lose the moral authority. That's what's happening right now. Uh, let me give you another example here. Uh, this is this is Jack Keane just a couple of days ago uh, saying that instead of saying that, yeah, what President uh, Biden is doing to at least try to find some sort of negotiated settlement and get a ceasefire for the people of, of Palestine, he says this. I really think behind the motivation of the president and his team is they really want the fighting to stop. They're not saying that, but I think that's the implication of it. And that if that happens, underscore what you just said, because if you leave multiple battalions effective 
in Gaza and most of the leaders effective in Gaza and the war terminates on those conditions, Hamas wins militarily in the long run. Why? Because they are effective enough to reattack at some point. See, here's the thing, Jack. Nobody said that the war should end today and just, Pam, stop fighting and go home and leave Hamas there. No one has said that. What the administration is saying, which most of the rest of the world is saying, is stop the killing of the innocent Palestinians. Have an immediate ceasefire so that we can get help to the people who need it the most. And then they subsequently say, have an intelligence-driven, targeted operation like the one that we require our troops to make when we have similar operations in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last few decades. That's what they're saying. Jack Keane should know this. And the fact that he's saying this means that either he's more ignorant than I realized or that he's very callously ignoring the reality and what's going on in order to make a point so that he can support Israel. And I I don't know what all his motivations may be. I, I don't care. All I can tell you is with great confidence that what he's saying is completely nonsense. Now, those are bad. It gets worse. Here's Lindsey Graham uh, some months back talking about what he would do to Iran. Now, given the fact that probably any day now, possibly even later tonight, Iran could strike back against Israel for what Israel did by by destroying a a building in the embassy compound in Syria of of Iran's, they're going to strike back. And, And of course, there's going to be no shortage of people like Lindsey Graham who then say, ah, look at this aggression. It's not going to be aggression. It's going to be a retaliation for the aggression that Israel put on them. But that doesn't matter. Here's where Lindsey Graham's head is. Here's my message. If Hezbollah, which is a proxy of Iran, launches a massive attack on Israel, I will consider that a threat to the the state of Israel, existential in nature. I will introduce a resolution in the United States Senate to allow military action by the United States in conjunction with Israel to knock Iran out of the oil business. Iran, if you escalate this war, we're coming for you. Okay, that that again, that briefs well to people who love to beat their chest and talk about how tough we are, you know, point to the camera, we're coming for you. Okay, Lindsay, number one, the U.S. military is not the defense force for Israel. Because something is going on between Israel and the United States, or Israel in in, in Iran, or any other country, or any other entity, that's their war to fight. It's not our war to fight. Our or our armed forces do not exist to go and help other countries fight their wars because we want to. Because look, Israel has already fought wars, major wars in their past. They did it just fine without any help from the United States. They will do the same thing here, too. That's the reason that we've been given billions and billions of dollars every single year for their national defense. And as a result, they have the most powerful military in the region, bar none. They are stronger than virtually everybody else. And that's even without all this stuff we're giving them right now uh, to continue to prosecute and sustain this war now over half a year. But if they choose, and that's the key point, if they choose to go to war with Iran because of striking their embassy, which is by itself an act of war, then they're on their own. Do not send American troops to go fight somebody else's war because you don't like the other side. That's an abuse of power. That's an abuse of American service members. People like me and the millions of others who signed up did so to defend our country from attack, defend our country, not to go on the offense because we don't like somebody else and it's just another tool to use by somebody else for their benefit. Because I assure you, Israel would love to have the U.S. armed forces. They would love to have our air force uh, and and our ammunition and our weapons and our industrial capacity. Absolutely. They would love it because it would make their life so much easier. I'm not interested in making life easier for Israel to choose a war to fight against somebody else that they don't like somebody in their neighborhood. So they want to try to draw us into a war to help them do their dirty work. I'm not for that. I'm wholeheartedly against that. I would not sacrifice one American service member, not one and and not one of your dollars to go fund us a war that someone else chose. Because I assure you, if Iran responds here, and it's we'll see what happens. I'm sure they're going to do something. It's They're going to try to avoid war because they don't want to go to war either. We're looking here if, if they do something anyway, and, and Israel chooses 
to launch a, a response that draws an actual war. If that happens, I would not send one American to do anything. It would be a travesty if any American who signed up to serve our country is used by another country to fight their war and they, they lose their life. That should be unconscionable. I don't care what kind of history we have with Israel, any country, I would not put that for. Our country, our military is for our country. Let's see if we can keep it that way. But uh, let's move on to the next area here, Russia, Ukraine. Unfortunately, we got another issues, a bunch of issues here. You're seeing that there's going to be some commonalities here among it. And it always goes back to arrogance and pride. And let's start off with Austin. But in the early part of this war, there's a war between Russia and Ukraine. They have their bilateral problems and their issues here are about Russia with its security on its border and Ukraine with wanting to join NATO. Those are the issues on the border. Here's Austin in early in the war. I want to see uh, Ukraine uh, remain a sovereign uh, country, a democratic country, able to protect its, uh, uh, its sovereign territory. Uh, we want to see Russia uh, uh, weakened uh, to the degree that it can't uh, do the kinds of things that uh, it has done uh, in, in invading Ukraine. So. so that's kind of an aspiration. Yeah, we'd like to see Russia weakened. So we're going to continue to send lots of our ammunition, lots of our weapons, as it turned out over the next two years. Uh, a lot of our capabilities, lots of our tax dollars, because we want to see Russia weakened. OK, well, as I've told you in detail many times, you can go back and see many of the previous episodes of Daniel Davis deep dive. But you'll see that that didn't happen. It would have earlier if we had been wise and to sought, seek a negotiated settlement early in the war in April of 2022, just after it had been barely two months old. If we had sought an war, a, a, a negotiated settlement then, which was on the table, Russia would have been weakened. They would have lost lots of troops. They would have lost lots of armored vehicles. Uh, and they would have been on the, their back legs and and they would not have yet ramped up their industrial capacity. And once you take the pressure of war off, then all of a sudden the impetus for putting more money into military goes way down, if not off the table. And it starts to go into rebuilding and uh, infrastructure and, and all kinds of other just regular economy. That's where it would go. So they we would have succeeded had we been wise in April of 2022, but we weren't, we wanted more. So then we kept the war going. Then the next great chance to succeed came in November of 2022. Also after Ukraine had their one and only big, two big successes in the Kherson city and in the Kharkiv district, they had two big military successes. And if as, as general Milley suggested at the time, they negotiate from a position of relative strength while Russia was weak. They had just mobilized 300,000 people. They were throwing guys barely trained into the gap to try to stop the bleeding. They were at their weakest point right then. That was the best time to make a negotiated settlement. Russia would have been weakened. Again, absent the impetus of war, it would have they would have not done a lot of the things they did subsequent. Instead, we chose arrogance. Ooh, we went a little bit far here. We got some, uh, Russia got hurt. Let's push a little harder, give a few more weapons. Now let's give some tanks, uh, some, uh, some artillery pieces, mobile stuff, tanks from other countries, air defense capabilities, some long range weapons, different kinds of aircraft. Let's just keep going here so that we can weaken them more. Well, what happened instead? Instead, Russia didn't get weakened. Russia recovered like Russia has done so many times in their history over the centuries in similar situations. Now they're stronger today than they were before the war. There was a, an article a couple of weeks ago, or I'm sorry, a couple of days ago that talked about the quantified that Russia has completely rebuilt everything they had, but now they've added things new. And yes, their Black Sea fleet is, is substantially weakened from what it was, and that's something they're going to have to navigate. But that has nothing to do with the war on the ground, which is all going in Russia's favor. And their military industrial capacity is now fully engaged, cranking stuff off the assembly line 24-7, 365. And it's continuing to grow. Ukraine will never be able to match the industrial capacity of Russia. They will never be able to match the personnel of Russia. So we have now, because of arrogance, caused ourselves harm because we can't succeed in this anymore. Now Russia is not only not being harmed, every month this thing goes on further, they grow stronger. There's a greater chance that the Ukraine army will buckle and eventually break with this relentless pressure 
than that it will ever stabilize or certainly reverse. So this idea that we're going to continue to go on uh, in hopes that that reverses is irrational, it's illogical, and it can't stand to just a, a cursory examination of the realities on the ground. But that doesn't stop our leaders from being irrational, as Secretary Blinken said just a few days ago. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway for, uh, for Ukraine uh, moving forward. Uh, we will see, I think, in the summit uh, very strong support for Ukraine going forward and its relationship with, uh, with NATO. Okay, for the moment, let me just explain something log uh, logistically, uh, paperwork-wise. So I've talked to you about the military balance, all this, and I think that's pretty clear about, so you know already what he said was nonsense on that. But let's look administratively. The NATO charter requires that for anybody to be admitted as a member, that they have to have any internal disputes resolved, and they can't have any border disputes that could go into war. They have to have everything resolved. What do you think is the prospect of this basically a civil war that's been going on inside Ukraine since at least 2014, or really late 2013. Uh, and this kind of a big border issue. Don't know if you've heard about this big war that's been going on for now in its third year, not likely to get resolved anytime soon. So even according to their own legit, uh, legislative issues, the way that the, the, the alliance extends, they have to have everything resolved internally and externally. None of that exists, and it won't for the foreseeable future. So for Blinken to go in front of God and country and everybody and say, yes, there's still going to be a NATO, and we're going to get a lot of support for that. Well, the only way you're going to get support for that is if we ignore all the ground truth reality, all the absurdities that that is the very issue, the, the number one issue that drove Russia to war in the first place, and that it violates every code that we have. Other than that, sure, that's something we should pursue. That is absurd. It's arrogant to be able to say that because it, it just keeps poking a finger in the face of your opponent to make sure that they keep fighting and it violates your own rules here. So, it, but it's not real. They're, we're not going to do that. There's, you have to have unanimity. So even if most of all of the rest of NATO was equally insane, well, it's not going to make any difference because people like Hungary and Slovakia and probably Turkey are not and they're never going to vote for that because to do so would be almost immediately to turn an Article 5 issue into go into war. No one is going to do that. Even, even France is not going to do that. Germany's not going to do that. They're not going to vote for war, a, a war of choice that they almost will certainly go nuclear and everyone would lose. That's so obvious. Why do we go down a path that can't succeed? And it, and it looks like there that Secretary Blinken, that wasn't good enough because that was just a few days ago. Earlier today, literally maybe an hour or so before we we're making this broadcast, uh, Lord Cameron, uh, the, the current uh, foreign minister for UK, is here in Washington, D.C., and they had a joint press conference with Blinken and him. And uh, here's what Lord Cameron had to say. On Ukraine, I want to echo what Tony said. Put simply, we know what works, we know what they need, and we know what is right for us. In terms of what works, we know that if we give the Ukrainians the support they deserve, they can win this war, they can achieve the just peace that they deserve. No, no, Lord Cameron, they, they aren't. That's not what they need. That's not how it works. That's not how war works. I, I mean, it, it's, it's troubling to me to hear people at the highest levels, make these kinds of statements. Just given $60 billion is not going to do anything except extend the lifeblood for Ukraine and delay the lose loss a little bit longer, maybe. And it might not even do that. It might not make any difference at all. At most, it's going to delay the outcome a little bit. But the issue, I keep saying this over and over, it's not money, it's men. It's not even machines. As, as important as money and machines are, it's men. Ukraine does not now, nor will they ever, have the manpower to unseat Russia. Again, just go back to the last year. Ukraine had the best chance they would ever get in the, in the summer of 2023 to unseat Russia. They didn't even dent the line. 
And now they're being driven back everywhere. And because they've lost hundreds of thousands of men, they will never have the manpower with the training, the, the uh, intensity and the ability to, to sustain combat. They will never be able to create something that they didn't even do a year ago when Russia is already demonstrably larger, stronger and more capable. It defies any kind of logic. And so for the foreign secretary to stand before the world and make those statements in Washington, D.C., it's divorced from reality. It's just arrogance to say, I want that to be true. And of course, that's the reason why Secretary Blinken had him on there. He's trying to give some extra firepower to his comments about, yeah, we're going to bring them into NATO. We're not going to bring them into NATO. They're not going to win, and they're definitely not going to get a sustained peace. And that's one of the biggest issues I want to point out here is that all of these arrogant statements right now, the biggest, the first bill payer are the people of Ukraine. All these folks that claim to care about Ukraine, to care about democracy, to care about all that stuff are the enablers of the destruction of Ukraine. With wisdom and foresight, we could have avoided war altogether. It didn't even need to happen. There were many off-ramps. Understand that. There were many off-ramps before February 2024, none of which we took. We wanted this to go to a war because we wanted to harm Russia. Or they would just arrogantly said, no one's going to tell me what to do. You remember the big issue you may recall prior to the war was nobody tells us who gets to come into NATO. We decide that for ourselves. So it was arrogance. Nobody tells me what to do. So even though that's a nuclear power on their border, and, and we're talking about moving a, a, a military alliance to their border, something we will never uh, accept in, in reverse, we expected them to do so. And so even though we saw all the signs in the world that they're ready to go to war, we just didn't care because we're arrogant. That's the, that's the reality we want. So we want the, no matter what actually is reality, we want this version to be. So we're acting on the pre preference at the expense of the reality. And, and hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian men are gone, never to be recovered. Entire cities have been literally wiped off the map. Some of them, like Marinka in, in the Donetsk area, it, it looks like a nuclear blast went off. There's, there's not a wall standing in that city. That's not the only one. Every day that delays adds to the casualty count. It adds to the cities being destroyed. You, you saw yesterday, I, sh I showed you the maps of uh, uh, from the Institute for the Study of War that shows every map you look at. All the area is methodically moving to the west. Russia just continues to move forward and to kill lots of Ukrainian men every single day. All these people are wrong. They're not going to win, and there's no rational path towards it. That's the, that's the initial bill payer. But then the other bill payers is going to be the United States. Because if we get dragged into a war, if especially if like Macron or some of these others who keep claiming that they're going to, if things get bad enough, they will send French troops into Ukraine. Or, or that Polish troops may go into the western part of Ukraine. Russia has already said if NATO troops or any foreign troops come in there, they're legitimate targets and we'll take them out, which then lends the possibility of an Article 5 situation and we could be at war with a nuclear power. It is insane that we're even toying with that possibility. Your future and your defense are, are riding on people who are operating on the arrogant presumption. And, and, and hubris that we just want what we want and we're going to blind ourselves to what's really going on. And then the last area I want to talk about here uh, is the China-Taiwan issue. And for this, we'll go back to the top where we started, President Biden. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's the commitment we made. To be clear, sir, U.S. forces... U.S. men and women would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion. Yes. Why? We have no defense treaty with Taiwan. There are, just like there were with Russia, Ukraine, there are with China, Taiwan, numerous off-ramps. This does not need to go to war at all. And, and even if China should do the irrational, which they have not done in the, uh, what, since 1949, they have not done it this up to this point, and there's every reason to believe they won't invade now as long as that there's no probability of you, of the, the Taiwanese declaring uh, independence. That's their trigger. That's They've said that. They've never said anything besides that. So don't mess with the trigger. 
Taiwan is today de facto free and independent. That without question, it's it's a, it's completely free. Uh, it, it's independence in everything but name. And as long as we keep on with the official narrative of one China, which we agreed to in the 70s, 1979, I believe is when we put that into effect, that there is but one China, y'all figured out. We're not going to recognize either one of you as, as being the leader. That's something y'all are going to do independently. As long as we keep you doing that, don't do anything to move towards independence. Don't act like it's an independent state and, and do things that you would do with other government officials. Just let them be free and leave it between China and Taiwan to figure that out. If we do that, the chances are that there will never be a war on the Taiwan Strait. But even if there is, even if China does the irrational and something that they, they is not in their interest and something that they have prohibited themselves from doing all this time, because it is possible, I don't dispute that at all. If they do, we cannot go to war over that. I don't care what Biden has said. There is no defense treaty, so there's no obligation. But much more than that, we don't have the capacity to do that because China has been on this long buildup for many, many years, decades, because they think that there is a chance that we would intervene on the behalf of Taiwan. So they have built a military designed specifically to intercept us on the offense. Now, globally, America has the greatest uh, amount of military power of any country on the world, especially when you're looking at terms of our Air Force, our Navy, our Army, our ability to project power along with the Marine Corps, uh, our nuclear triad, all those things, we truly do have more capacity than anybody else. Here's the problem with that, though, or not, not, not necessarily the problem. Here's the truth of that, though. It's not unlimited. See, too many people in America right now, especially among the elite, still think it's 1991. Like the Cold War is over. Uh, China is, is a peasant army. The Soviet Union has, has collapsed. Russia is a shell, uh, a rusty shell from what it used to be. And that leaves us alone in, in charge of everything. And so we can literally do anything we wanted to in the 1990s. And we did. And it, it, whether Beijing said something or, or Russia or somebody in Serbia or whatever, we just like laughed at them. E even if even if our allies said something like France and Germany prior to us going into the Iraq war in 2003, uh, we, we uh, were really strained at that time because they didn't want us to go into it. They said it was a dumb idea. We didn't care what anybody said. We did what we wanted. And and other than suffering through the, the losses we had on there, which were embarrassing, but on a national level, we we came through that fine, didn't destroy our economy. The army was still intact, uh, even though it was catastrophic for the people that fought it. But you see what I'm saying? We could do that because no one had the power to do anything about it. That's no longer the case. China is not a peasant army anymore. They're now becoming a very modern army. And especially in their backyard where this war would take place, they have the strength and they have the capacity to, to defeat us. I mean, let's just be blunt. They can defeat us if we choose to fight China over Taiwan in their backyard, then almost certainly we would lose. Many, many war games have been done that says that we could potentially prevent China from taking Taiwan, but at it, it, it catastrophic cost, aircraft carriers being sunk in, in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, hundreds of fourth and fifth generation fighters going down, thousands of Americans, and allegedly that would end up in a success because we would prevent China. I think that those, those were flawed because they all went on a short period of time, whereas China's thinking long term. China has the ability to sustain combat, even if they suffered all the casualties that that CSIS uh, uh, exercise and many similar like it show. They still can't win the. They, they can still win the war because they have the ability, the manpower, and they have the industrial capacity to continue to fight long term. We don't. We have the manpower, but we don't have the industrial capacity. Our, some of the missile capacities you heard uh, Mark Kensian of CSIS say on our show last week. Some of those categories would be out in a week. China won't be out in a week. So once we deal all this death and destruction on them and they've shot a lot of the stuff on us, they can keep going. We can't. So it is arrogant to say we're going to go fight there. We're going to go fight China over Taiwan because we can't, and it would be foolhardy to do so. And you see, you see that's weaving around all around the areas of the world we've gone so far is this arrogance that says this is the outcome we prefer. We want this to happen. 
So we're going to take action and policies based on this preference at the at the exclusion of whole categories of ground truth reality. Right now, here's the situation, folks. Right now, we're not at war with China, Russia, Iran, or North Korea. We're not at war with any of them. Right now, we are strong. We have a good, solid economy. We have a good foundation from which that even if we have some economic downturns, which are inevitable, every nation has them, we can endure them. We can we can get through them and then recover like we always have. All of those things are possible right now. As long as we get rid of this arrogant problem that we have, because if Biden or any subsequent administration crosses that line and we do fight China, or we cross a line and, and, and we do get dragged into a war with Russia or even in, in, in Iran. If, if in the next 24, 48 hours, we do some of the things that Lindsey Graham suggested and we get sucked into a war there, we have a whole new level of problems that we have never had before and that we don't need. Unless China, Russia, North Korea, or Iran launches a premeditated, unprovoked attack against us for no reason, then, of course, we give them a withering response. And that's why we have a national defense. That's why they won't do it, because they know that we have that capacity. But if we choose to fight any of those people, a war that is not necessary, then they'll have no choice but to respond back in full. And now then we it's game on and we haven't had a, a war against a, a peer opponent or anybody even close to that for decades. Nobody in uniform today has any concept of what it would be like to fight a peer adversary other than, you know, looking at a computer. But I assure you that's a lot different than doing it in real life. And things would not go as well for us as what so many th seem to assume they would if we fought a Russia, China, North Korea, or Iran. I assure you things would not go as well. And, and it's an unknown what would happen. I, I can't predict how any of those things would go because there's so many variables uh, that, that you, you can't possibly even uh, imagine how they would go. But I can tell you it would be bad. And it would be a lot worse than it's hit. And of course, especially with, with three of those four, it could go nuclear. And I don't have to tell you what that would mean. It could be catastrophic for our country. Absolutely catastrophic. Why would we ever want to even dance around something that could be catastrophic when here's what we could do. We could uh, in insist that the Russia-Ukraine war back uh, wind down. Instead of saying we're going to give you another sixty billion dollars and then another hundred billion next year and another hundred billion after that or hundred and something twenty billion like the uh, Europeans want to do, we say here's a finite amount of money to help you hold the line you got now as long as you seek publicly a negotiated settlement and we'll help you. Once that money's gone, you're on your own. So let that be your guide. Now that sounds harsh, but that's actually not harsh. That's actually wise policy. Because that gives the incentive to finally acknowledge reality, even in Kiev, which also is even worse with not wanting to look at reality than we are. Now everybody has to look at reality. That war can be brought to an end. It won't be on terms that are pretty to Kiev. They could have had those earlier. Now they can't. But they can stop it. They can end the carnage. They can end the destruction so that they have a future and a hope. That is very much possible. In the the, the Middle East, <clears throat> we can insist that Israel change its policies or, or they can do it on their own, but they're not going to do it with American weapons. And if they choose to fight a war with Iran, make sure they know they're on their own. We will not fight a war for them on uh, against another opponent when we don't need to fight a war. And then stick to those guns. Continue to defend ourselves. If Iran should foolishly attack Americans, uh, in, in the process of going after Israel, then we'll respond to that and retaliate without question, without hesitation. But we're not going to get into a war for Israel or any other country for that matter. In the China-Taiwan issue, we make sure Taiwan knows that we are not going to fight a war for them. We'll say that pub privately. Publicly, we'll stick with the one China principle with the strategic ambiguity so that we won't, we won't make any commitments to anything one way or the other. But privately, we'll tell Taiwan we will not fight a war for you. So make sure you cooperate with China, do whatever you need to do to keep the status quo. There's no reason why that can't go on for decades more. And China benefits from that. They don't want a war. They want to have good economic relations and national security on their borders. 
And as long as that, that happens, that's the most, as long as there's no war, as long as there's no declaration of independence, as long as we don't fight for Taiwan, there's every reason to think there won't be a war. But even if there was, like I said, then we need to stay out of it because that is not in America's interest to get into a fight. We can't win. And part of being a strong nation means to have the wisdom to understand where your limits of power are, when you can flex and when you can't, and when flexing would end up getting you harmed. All of those things are possible right now. Same thing with North Korea. There's they, even though they're making lots of noise lately and they're having lots of missile tests and you know their nuclear weapons are advancing, there's still no match for us. So they're not going to launch a suicidal attack because they know for sure that we could wipe out the regime in an afternoon. And they're right, we can. And because of that, as long as we don't choose to fight a war with North Korea, there won't be one. That's where we are right now. And as long as we keep that just basic wisdom, we don't need to fight any wars and we'll keep being prosperous. We'll keep uh, continue having freedom uh, and we'll continue to be, uh, you know, leaders in many parts of the world and we'll, everything will be fine. That's where we should go. And I pray to God that's where we do that. We get rid of this sickness, this illness of arrogance that says we just want the outcome we desire, no matter what the reality is on the ground. Because this stuff, it's kind of eye rolling in many places right now. But if we go too far in any one of these directions I've talked about, things could go bad in a minute. And it could be very catastrophic and fatal for many Americans. And I don't want that for any of us. Now, that's uh, that's your, that's your deep dive for today. It's a little bit different than most of them here. But I, I felt because a lot of these things we're kind of touching on in some of our episodes, I wanted to make sure you saw how this all fits together comprehensively and how dangerous some of these comments really are. And uh, we want to make sure that we hold people's feet to the fire. And so when they make nonsense statements like this that we tell them, we say, hey, that's that's crazy. Don't do that. We're going to continue to do that because we're unintimidated and uncompromised on the truth because I want what's best for you. I want your country to continue to have peace. I want every country to have peace. I don't want anyone to have war because they don't need it. And it's horribly destructive, as you can see here. That's your deep dive for today. Folks, uh, come back and, and join us because we're going to have some, some more great shows like we always do uh, tomorrow. And then Thursday is a big day. We have Colonel Jacques uh, Bao, who is one of our new popular ones here because he's got such great insights on so many things. Uh, and John Mearsheimer, again, uh, one of our big favorites, uh, is also going to be back on Thursday. You definitely won't want to miss those two show. Put them on your calendar. Thanks very much. Like and subscribe. Share this with your friends. Tag people who make crazy statements with this so that they can see the truth. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.